Hello, and welcome to another edition of The Open Road, a show where we look at different aspects of open source and open source communities. My name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen, and we are both part of the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat. Over the last few episodes, we've been talking about citizenship, membership in projects. We've delved a little bit into governance. But one of the things that we tend to do when we do these interviews is say, so what didn't we ask you? And this gives our guests an opportunity to wax eloquent about anything related or potentially sometimes unrelated to the topic at hand. And this, this always gives us some interesting insight that we weren't explicitly looking for. So that's what this episode is. It's kind of a grab bag of the bonus material, the, uh, the bonus reel on these interviews. Yeah, and you will see that, you know, we're not quite the professional polished people <laughs> that we appear to be um, because some of this material is, is a little unedited, but it's, it's pretty clean and, um, and, and it was really interesting stuff and we didn't want to just throw it in the can and, and not uh, share it with you. And, and so the first a conversation that we had was with Greg Crow Hartman, who is one of the Linux kernel maintainers. Um, as you've known, you know, if you've been watching past episodes, Greg has offered some unique insights on the role of governance in community because the Linux kernel takes a very straightforward approach to how it does things. And in the course of the conversation that we had, Rich had basically, we had already kind of uh, discovered that, you know, some of the uh, administrative overhead, as for lack of a better term, was handled for the kernel community by the Linux Foundation. And Rich asked Greg um, specifically what it is that they did for the Linux kernel community. And that led into this conversation. Well, the Linux Foundation itself has no influence on Linux kernel development, other than the fact that it has hired three of the Linux kernel developers, but our contract famously says they can't tell us what to do, and we can't tell them what to do, so it works out well that way. Um, and nobody has ever, ever said, oh, because you're a Linux Foundation employee, you have to do this. That's never happened, and that would never happen. Um, that being said, we do have a tiny bit of infrastructure, but that's owned by kernel.org, which is another nonprofit, which now is run by the Linux Foundation because it works really well to have the Linux Foundation run that. And they provide IT resources and um, makes it easier for us to do. So we do rely on that infrastructure. Um, but that being said, um, while it's not tiny, it's not massive by any means. It's a pretty much server and we have some mirror organizations and we write some tools for it. Um, so we use the Linux Foundation, the kernel community does because it works out well for us, very low overhead. The companies that are involved in that are interested in seeing Linux succeed, so they provide the limited resources that we need, and they all work towards that goal. We have a good feedback loop to talk to companies directly, which works out well as well. Um, so yeah, the Linux Foundation doesn't, they provide the, the resources that we need, um, and it helps out, it works out well. Um, but it's not anything huge, per se. They do a great job of it, and we're very happy <laughs> with what they do. Um, so, but there's no puppet master pulling any strings and no companies have any influence. It just doesn't work that way. Thank I, you. That, this was very, this was very eye-opening because I, I have not been involved in the Linux project. I've been, I've been primarily in, in projects that have much more complicated governance. And so, yeah, thanks. That was very I mean, you, if you go to kernel.org, you see our infrastructure. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so, and git.kernel.org, yeah, it's pretty tiny. Well, right, and and there's just this huge spectrum of the way different projects approach how they govern their communities. Because you know, Rich is coming from the Apache Software Foundation, and that's got a fairly rigorous. Uh, totally, you have a rules on accepting accepting projects and what the projects need to buy. By I mean, we are just we would be the equivalent of one of your tiny little projects in the Apache yeah. Foundation, right? Yeah. yeah, and we are just one of the little tiny projects that's run under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Mm -hmm. But they just run our infrastructure type stuff. That's it. 
it's even it's like a tiny little, little project is controlling the world. No, <laughs> no, it's just. It's like very that. weird. It's, it, if you step back and think about it, yeah, it's kind of odd. But then I would argue, and we I know a number of people have argued about this in the past, where projects like what was it, um, OpenStack was way too big. Uh -huh. right? If they if they trimmed down their governance and removed some of the rules and things that they had, it might have worked better, right? And a number of people that were involved in the kernel community tried to push that and make it easier. Because I mean, OpenStack had these huge hurdles just to even contribute. They, it yeah. prevented people from contributing. Um, I will point out OpenStack doing something what I think was really wrong is they forced IRC meetings all the time, right? So people whose English is not their native language have a very difficult time participating. Um, and that's one thing with the Linux kernel, we want to make it very easy for anybody to participate. All you need is an email client. That's it. And people still think that's too much at times, but um, <laughs> that works really well when English is not your native language and you have to uh, you can think about something and process it and then contribute back and really works well and it slows things it slows the immediacy down but it makes the overall throughput much much higher and much better yeah do you think the difference in the way these different kind of communities are structured like like you mentioned openstack and the first thing that came to my mind was well that's a bunch of companies that got together yeah, it was. And it was put together by a traditional way of developing a product, right? As opposed to the kernel, which was a bunch of individual developers got together first. It has since grown beyond that. But the core, the, the original, was individuals versus OpenStack being a corporation. Um, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, so, let me put, let me put that. so everybody contributes to Linux kernel in a selfish way, but we're usually doing so for a company, right? I mean, companies, Linux kernel for the past 20 plus years since I've been tracking it, over 80% of the contributions are coming from people paid to do this work. So companies have always been involved and always been interacting. And it's just, we contribute on an individual basis. And that's what matters because your name is on it. It's not your company's name on it. Your company's name is reflected. But when your name is on it and when it's you being responsible for this, you do better work. You're not, I mean, famously, one of the one person said, I'm terrified when I contribute stuff to the kernel because that's public. It's going to be public for the rest of my life, right? Um, and that's good because you do a really good job. When you're hiding behind a corporation and just submitting right. stuff and checking it in at the end of the day, it doesn't work. So you are individuals and we recognize individuals. We do not allow aliases of, oh, here's a, a maintaining team that works from this company. No, we want to know the individual developer's name, who's responsible for this. And go for there, and that 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 means you take more responsibility, and you do a better job. And I think more projects would do that better. Um, it would be much better to, if they could do that. And time-based releases, do time-based releases. Um, companies don't like doing time-based releases. <laughs> anyway, time-based releases solve so many problems. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you very much for this insight. I, I, this this will be an interesting counterpoint to our to our other interviews. Are there other people running large projects that want, have lots of governance? And like, uh, well, we you know, no some of them, we have no project managers. Think about that. Yeah, I some of the folks that we're project managers. Some of the folks that we're talking to are running much smaller projects with much more governance, and so. Uh, Crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've been involved in a number of uh, helping a number of projects scale better. And a lot of times they're running into these scaling problems because of this governance, because of these rules. Yeah. Docker infamously ran into the wall. Kubernetes ran into this wall. Um, when you start wanting to scale past a certain number of things, a lot of these restricted rules that you put on place on your own self in the beginning because of things that you were worried about just need to be thrown away because it just won't even work. And, you know, at Apache, we spend a lot of time gently chastising projects that put a lot of unnecessary hurdles in place. But then we have a lot of governance at the top, but but we try to eliminate the governance at the project level. That's good. Um, and, and that's great. And that provides you're providing a legal and an infrastructure framework for yeah. these projects to do what they want to do. I mean, the Linux Foundation is good. And they never, they accept all these other projects as well. And they don't tell the individual projects how to run, right? They're willing to offer. I mean, I, I'll go and talk to them if they want to know, but let these projects figure it out themselves. We will provide best practices if they want to do this stuff. But I mean, it's like with children, you can only learn by doing, right? <laughs> no matter how much you tell them not to do something, they'll still want to do it and learn themselves. Um, but no, Apache's great in that way. It does Eclipse does the same way as Linux Foundation. These are great incubators of individual projects and hopefully they can learn from this. And 
the more it's hard to get companies and people whose jobs it is to be a project manager to remove themselves from the equation, yeah. right? No, <laughs> it's hard. So I find myself thinking, listening to this, that there's at least three topics here that that Greg brings up that kind of warrant their own separate discussion. And mm -hmm. one of them is something we actually have in our notes for future episodes. And this is the, the, uh, the, the way that open source projects these days are moving out of email and into things like Slack, things that are, are more chat-based, immediate. And Greg is, is uh, saying that email is superior in every way because of the pace, because of the, um, the ability for people that are not in the same language or time zone or culture to participate. Um, and, and that's that's a whole other conversation that people have very strong opinions on, and I have strong opinions on. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that he raised was the uh, the distinction between contributing to a project as an individual or as a corporation, and that's an enormous discussion. And right. uh, so, I mean, this is all this is all really really good stuff. Um, but the the topic that you mentioned when you introduced this segment was regarding what happens at the project level and what happens at the foundation level. And what I noticed was that Greg mentioned some of the same things that our other guests mentioned about this same thing, that the governance, or in this case, the Linux Foundation is responsible for personnel and asset, asset management and sponsor relations. And these are things that are happening at the project level in many other places. But here, they've they've split this between those administrative tasks and the actual job of putting together a piece of software, which was a major topic in our last conversation. You know, splitting administrative from technical. Yeah, exactly. And 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 here we finally kind of get to the the common ground. I think that Greg uh, has been explaining about the Linux kernel. Uh, project because you know all along we've been at least for me actively marveling at you know wow that is really awesome how you can just sort of just go off do the yeah. do the contributions and and everything's just running but and and that is certainly true but they did give some of that governance uh, structure to the foundation. So it's not, you know, unpresent. It, yeah, it's certainly yeah. there. It's just in a different place and, and a different organization is managing it. And and I think really, you know, I remember I remember when Linus Torvalds and some of the early kernel developer or maintainers, sorry, were hired by the Linux Foundation. And that was a big deal because the the idea that Linus was working for one private company and working on the Linux kernel, you know, seemed, it seemed cumbersome and awkward. And a lot of people were like wondering how that was going to work. And the Linux Foundation sort of solved that problem and said, he will work for this independent organization. And, and that worked. Um, and, and I think they've kept up with that whole, you know, independent notion. Yeah. And it, it's great that they've been able to, 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 work out an arrangement where he can do what needs to be done without being told what to do. And it reminds me of, and I can't remember exactly when this was, but there was a time when um, uh, Guido Van Rossum, the, mm -hmm. the developer of the Python language, and Larry Wall, the developer of the Perl language, were in a similar situation. They were employed by a company who let them pay their bills but didn't get in the way of telling them what to do and both of those situations broke down very quickly because the companies in question did want to direct their day-to-day -day work and it ended up being untenable because they couldn't do their their supposed real job yeah um and and it, it, it's got to be hard because at the end of the day you have to eat um yeah. and 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 it you know 
Greg pointed out rightly, because, and he's been keeping track of this for years, you know, and he releases reports uh, quite, you know, at least once a year, I believe, on the makeup of the Linux kernel developer community. And as he said, about 80%, if I'm quoting him correctly, of kernel developers are employed somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and probably- Are employed a, specifically you, for this task, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Right. So it's not just that they're employed and, you know, they're, they, they're, they're okay. They're actually, this is their job working yeah. on the Linux kernel. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we've got colleagues. I know we've got colleagues at Red Hat. Yeah. You've got people at Canonical. you got people at SUSE. you got people at IBM and um, Oracle <clears throat> who are all doing the same thing. Yeah. And the list goes on and on. Um, and, and, you know, <clears throat> And, and that gets back to his point that he raised in a prior episode where developers, in his words, tend to contribute selfishly, um, which again, I, I think is a very succinct way of putting it. That we, you know, you're going into a project, yes, it's open source, yes, it's collaborative, yes, we're contributing to the greater good, but I as an individual person have selfish motives, whether it's for me that I want to get some feature into the kernel or my company who mm -hmm. wants to get a feature into the kernel or something out, whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, so I, I think this balance that they've come up with um, is really good. Um, and yeah, you're right. He went into a ton of other things. And and I don't want to get into the whole IRC email <laughs> thing because no, that's a whole other topic for another that's a day. Whole I think other thing we've got episodes coming about that. Um, but yeah, definitely definitely a nice uh, ending to the conversation uh, that we have with Greg. Uh, we really appreciated his time uh, being with us on the show. And now we are going to wrap all of this up with with uh, Dave Neary's bonus material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dave, Dave, we actually were a little bit more open ended. Um, it wasn't a really a continuation of the conversation. So just to give you an idea, when we do these, we have a list of questions that we know we're going to break out into, you know, individual episodes. And most of the time that works. Sometimes we sidetrack a little bit, but we keep them to the topics that we have because we know which episodes we're going to do. But we always, you know, well, we try. We don't always do this, but we try to ask the question at the end, uh, something along the lines of, okay, what didn't we cover? What, what, what things are you passionate about? What do you want to share with us that we didn't go over? And so we asked Dave that question and turned to form as thoughtful as a human being he is, he came up with some really interesting stuff, which led into a pretty philosophical conversation. Well, I mean, the choice of the word citizenship was interesting to me um, because it implies, you know, becoming a citizen of a country other than by birth mm -hmm. implies, in some sense, giving up an allegiance to something else and swearing allegiance to i mean i'm thinking of national citizenship sure swearing allegiance to another nation um you know you're signing up to something and in some sense uh unless you live in a country which allows dual citizenship or uh, where you're from a country that allows dual citizenship you're giving up your former identity and adopting a new one and i think identity is such an interesting idea um in that it's evolving all the time uh, you know, if you think of, again, I'm going back to the OpenStack stack example. In the early days of OpenStack, everybody who was working on OpenStack was an OpenStack developer. After three or four years, you had Nova developers and Cinder developers and Swift developers. And um, the developers are the, the people who are contributing to a specific project added that identity. It subsumed the identity of being or became more important to them than the identity mm -hmm. of being an OpenStack developer. And um, I feel like it's possible to, you know, feel belonging to multiple groups at the same time. Yeah. And 
I'm interested. I, I mean, I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are about um, this idea of citizenship and whether the idea of of having fealty to a project um, is in conflict with other identities that uh, that you might have. I, I mean, I don't know. I the idea for me is more along the lines of like the metaphor that I have in my head is is actually around um, surprisingly religious uh, connotations because I have been, you know, I participated and been members of different churches and different denominations over the year, and they all have different ways of doing things. Um, so, you know, like who gets to have communion is a big one. And, and I'm not advocating or whatever, you know, a communion, but it's, there's a fence there. And the, that's the idea. Like there's a fence that you belong enough to the community. It's not just showing up at church sometimes. Sometimes it's actually, you've got to do more. Um, you have to be declarative. You have to go through, depending on the denomination, you have to go through classes or what. There's a whole thing sometimes. Sometimes you just walk in and like, yeah, here you go. Um, so, and the me, same is true in open source projects. Yeah, well, right. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it is. And 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 again, church is not a great example or any religious you know organization because typically most people belong to one at a time. So it does not lend itself to. The multiple uh, identity factor. I, I mean, I don't well, know. Maybe citizenship isn't the right word, perhaps. but to me, it's a shorthand for what do you what what is it what does it take to belong to a community? And I think in the open source world, you can belong to different communities. Um, I work with Rich on Apache, you know, but I'm also heavily involved in you know Red Hat oriented projects that are not in Apache. So to me, it's just whatever hat I'm wearing at the at the time, as the case may be. So I don't know, Rich. Well, one of the continuums that, that you touched on there and that, you know, Dave illustrated in his in his opening um, literary quote, the, the, the continuum from I'm part of this community because I choose to be and I value that to some projects that put this enormously high barrier to entry before they will open the doors and let you in and and you know whether that's commit rights or whether that's even allowing you to say that you're a member of the project um, some projects put that bar ridiculously high and as a result make people feel unwelcome and uh you know i i kind of want projects to be closer to that that first end of the spectrum but many of the projects that I've been involved with over, over the years are much closer to the other end. So it's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it's not so much swearing fealty to a project as, as, uh, as identifying yourself with it and saying, this is something that I care about and want to put my time towards. And so, I think, I think that changes that varies over time. Um, yeah. Younger projects have a much lower bar to becoming membership. It's, oh, you use my project? Awesome. Here, come in. And uh, when it when you get older, you, uh, uh, older in terms of uh, project age, mm -hmm. and when a project gets bigger, you have this kind of Dunbar number phenomenon where every now and again, oh, we're up to 15 contributors. Uh, we'd better add some structure so that we know, you know what our coding standards are and what it takes for us to, uh, to accept a, pa a patch. And so things that were unsaid before become said, and you hit fifty, and then something else happens, and one hundred and fifty, and something else happens, and and um, as you grow, um, almost by necessity, there becomes this this gradient, and it becomes harder to get to the center. But yeah. I really like the idea of having a low bar for feeling like you belong, and a high bar for becoming a leader. There's a book that I've read called uh, The Art of Community by Charles Vogel. Mm -hmm. um, not the art of community by John O'Bacon, um, and and Charles actually comes from a church background, uh, so it was interesting that you used that example. I think it's a, actually a, an excellent example because 
because there are so many ceremonies around becoming a member of a church, whether it's, you know, the ceremony of baptism where you're specifically admitted to a church or, you know, the ceremony of um, communion where you're breaking bread. It's, 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 um, uh, it's, uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a reaffirmation of, of membership. Yeah. It's, it, but I was even, uh, it's like ceremony is not the right word. It is, um, sacrament. Sacrament is the word that some word. churches use. Word I was looking for. Um, it's uh, ritual is what I was yeah. like. Every community has their rituals, their rites of passage. And, um, that's a good example. Uh, so I, I think actually it's it's a really good example of, of a church because you can also have a very strong identity as being a member of a church, but you can also have other identities that coexist with that, you know, based on, you know, being a member of a town council or, um, you know, working on an open source project or being a teacher or whatever your, your identity is. And it's always going to be multifaceted. Um, I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> off my train of thought. But yes, Charles Vogel, and he talks about having a, a specific, um, like a doorway, having having a, an entry point where you know, before this point, I'm outside, after this point, mm -hmm. I'm inside. And that opportunity to have a passage, which is marked, either you're invited, you're added to something, you're, you're called, you're introduced to a group, whatever that ceremony is, that there's some ceremony of induction. Um, and I think that's a that's a useful idea uh, in terms of growing communities. And, and I think that ceremony of induction should be a low bar, um, even for older projects. But that can be different from the ceremonies that are involved in becoming an elder in a in a community or. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, expanding upon that, do you? I, and I agree with you. They should be a low bar, but should they also be explicit? Because some communities don't necessarily bother telling you you're in, you know, they they just they don't. They just are like, yeah, oh, that you're he's he or she is a member now, uh, and and nobody sent them an email or anything like that. Like Apache will tell you because they make a bigger deal out of that, you know, and and they'll tell you if you're a member of the foundation. Um, I think so. it should be explicit, and and like in a pat in the case of Apache, I think there are, uh, Rich would agree that there are many people who are involved in Apache who are not members of the foundation, and mm -hmm. who would still feel like they belong in Apache, that they have mm -hmm. a, a sense of belonging. Uh, it's not just about signing up to a mailing list. Maybe it's the first time you send an email to a mailing list. Uh, maybe the idea that you know you notice the first time somebody sends an email to a mailing list, and and it's like, oh hey this is your first email welcome um but yes i do think it should be explicit so i have thoughts but i said many of them in that recording you but, did uh, <laughs> i think we both did yeah yeah <laughs> um a couple things that came to mind were the, his uh his mention of identity now anyone who's ever watched one of my videos or been on a call with me has seen this behind me the Apache feather. And that's definitely a pretty big part of my identity. My entire adult life, I have been involved in the Apache Software Foundation. It's a huge part of my identity. And uh, that's that's something that, that I say about myself. It's something that I embrace. But it's also, you know, it comes back to this notion of a of a ritual, of a ceremony of some kind telling you, hey, you're on the inside now. And so many projects don't do that. They just expect you to know. But some people need to be told because otherwise they'll always feel that they're on the outside. And I've seen this done a number of really good ways. Um, the one that came to mind while I was listening to this is the Fedora badges. Fedora doesn't just say, hey, welcome aboard. They celebrate every time you make a minor milestone. And I think that that is just such a powerful way to welcome people and reaffirm constantly that that you're one of us, that you're part of the project, that you're valued and that you are a citizen. And I just I love that particular tradition within the Fedora community. Yeah, I I um, 
and it, and it comes in pretty fast. I mean, you basically, you make yourself an identity on the Fedora uh, authentication system and, and, and you will start getting badges, you know, fairly, fairly often if you do just even, as you said, the minimal amount of work. And I'm not, and it's not to say that they're participation prizes, you know, they're actually legit things. Like, oh, I, yeah. you know, I went into Fedora and I'm the writer. So, you know, I'm writing. So I get, you know, I start contributing blogs and, and other things and, you know, boom, my, my badge count went up and it was, and, and yeah, it was perfect because it let me know that even in an automated way, the community was aware of what I was doing. And more importantly, I mean, not everybody's into it for egoism, you know, but if that were my line of thought, it would be like, I've got badges, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's know, what motivates some people. And that's, right. that's, that's legit. Yeah. For themselves or to show off to others, because we yeah. all want to feel like, you know, what we're doing matters. And, and another problem that you have with, with not really being explicit about, letting people know that they're part of a community is that you might get a situation where you don't feel comfortable um putting input into the community mm -hmm. you you'll you'll feel yeah. like i need to i need to sit back i need to listen and not raise my hand and it you know at times it's always going to be a thing whether you're part of a community or not you 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 know as my mom always said you should always you know listen before you speak um a lesson that I've not learned uh, <laughs> completely well, certainly, you know, with my facial expressions alone. Um, but seriously, you know, knowing that you're part of a community empowers you. It Absolutely. empowers you to communicate or I'm sorry, contribute more and and and, and communicate uh, more effectively because you feel like you. Okay, this is my place. It gives you permission, mm -hmm. and and you know some people say around open source. Well, everybody has permission. It's open source, but but certain people with certain personalities, like myself, need to be told you have permission, and uh, you know that that gives you it gives you an authority that's not just me saying I have the authority. Right, right. It it, it gives you it gives you that self of of worth that. You, you you know you you might not really have and and this gets into a lot of you know mental health issues and things like that but you know even on a casual level it's nice to know that you have an opportunity to be heard i mean mm -hmm. not everybody's going to agree with you that's fine it's that's the way the world works but if you know that you're part of it enough to be heard that's a good thing um yeah and I know I know we're running a little long here, but I had another sure. anecdote that came to mind while I was listening to this. And this was Dave was talking about how when the community gets to a certain size, you have to start writing down your your foundational concepts so that so that you can clearly communicate. And what this reminded me of was that in the early years of Apache, we would all talk about the Apache way and everybody knew everybody knew what that meant. And there came a point where we got to a size where people would say, okay, what is this Apache way that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And various people would step up and say, well, it means this. And then someone else would say, but no, that's not what I understood at all. <laughs> and, and there was this, there were several years where there was, you know, there was this discussion of what the heck is the Apache way that we've been using this term and everybody means something different by it, but we all thought that everyone else had a common understanding. And so, you know, this this reemphasizes just the importance of of documenting, like we say at Red Hat, talking about your why, talking about why you do the things that you do, um, you know, and just saying we do open source because it's the right thing. It it doesn't hold any water. You have to actually talk about why you're doing these things, why it's the right thing, why it matters. And you need to write those things down so that you can communicate it to the people that weren't in the room when you had that conversation.
Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is, you know, we're not telling tales out of school. This is a big part of what Rich and I do at Red Hat is we're not only educating people outside of Red Hat, um, but we're educating people inside of Red Hat because, you know, we have colleagues that have been around since, you know, there are maybe like two, 3,000 people who worked at Red Hat, a much smaller group. Well, now we're, you know, past 20,000 employees and not everybody, it's the same scaling problem you were talking about with Apache in that, you know, not everybody knows why we're doing this or how we're doing this. So we're writing it down. It's to preserve the methods. It's to preserve the best practices. And it's also to preserve the culture. You know, what does that red hat behind us mean? You know, you've got your feather. We both have the red hat, you know, that's a part of our identity too, but not everybody understands what that means, even within our own company. So it's important, and I absolutely agree, to write this down, to preserve culture and everything else. Which is a good time to make a plug for uh, theopensourceway.com, mm -hmm. which, uh, which documents many of these things. And of course, it's very opinionated because you know, we wrote it and we participated in writing it, but uh, we, we definitely recommend that as, as sort of a codification of, of some of these principles. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, kind of coordinated and organized by our colleague, Carson Wade, uh, who did a fantastic job on the first version of the open source way and then helped uh, get the second one, the second version, which is much more of a community collaborative uh document or set of documents out um carson's done a great job on that project and yeah the open source way.com definitely good plug we don't plug very often so we'll do that maybe we'll get sponsors hmm. no. <laughs> so i guess that kind of wraps up this particular series we want to particularly thank greg and dave and jack for their for their participation and for giving us so generously of their time. Absolutely. And, and, and to give you a preview after this, we're going to be moving on to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a serious issue that's uh, a lot of company or communities are, are wrestling with in various ways, shapes, and forms. So we have reached out to experts around the open source, uh, ecosystem to come and talk to us about the issues surrounding DEI. Um, and that'll be coming up on the next arc of the open road. Um, so until then, we wish you well. My name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. And thank you for joining us on this walk on the open road.